Thank you for coming to the first paper session. Uh, the first paper we're going to have is leave by... Leave light, Dana. Dana, leave the lights up just for a sec. Thank you. We're going to have David Rabkin with his uh, paper presentation, Spherical Video, You Have the Power. Thank you very much. Um, two things. So, hearkening back to some of the comments before, whenever we produce a show, we create an educator guide and we map to standards, and that can be very helpful for you, and we create activities. Second thing, in the spirit of sort of creativity here, this is going to look like a technology and tools presentation, but actually it's not, because I believe that you can all do what we've done, and once you're able to do it, then we together have to figure out what the heck to do with this particular technique. And that's really what I want, that's the conversation I want to engage you in later in this conference at my poster session and all that. So let's dive into the how-to, um, and I'm going to try to be pretty quick so there's time for questions afterwards. So the, the, the topic here is spherical video and ever since I recently became a planetarium director in Boston, I've asked the question, why the heck can't I actually get out there and film any darn thing I want and project it into my dome so that I am immersing an audience, it's photographic, it's totally realistic, it's live action, it's gorgeous. Why can't I do that? That was my dream. I needed this stuff. I need 4K frames that look like that, at least 30 frames per second. And it ought to be possible, right? So I definitely was inspired by techniques that all of us have used, right? Using full dome stills. Um, if any of you saw the Worldviews Network's uh, uh, presentations, they use these spherical single frame bubbles. They'd immerse the audience in it. They'd pan and tilt in there. Gorgeous, but it was just a single frame. It wasn't in motion. Um, if you look at Skyscan's amazing time-lapse work using digital single-lens reflex cameras, it's spectacular and gorgeous, but you're limited because the, those cameras can only do 8 or now usually 11 frames per second. So at 30 frames per second, people start looking like cartoon characters. So they had to make a lot of artistic decisions limited by that. Plus, it was kind of an expensive and extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Any of you have seen Earthquake? The opening scene of Earthquake is spectacular. It's got two HD uh, frames or, or, or regions in an animated full dome sequence. It's, it's gorgeous. They also use a red one in a subsequent shot, which is a very expensive, beautiful video camera with a fisheye lens on it. Um, but all of these don't quite get it to the point where mortals can afford to, to do this. And I kept thinking, the technology's moving so fast, you know, damn it, can't, can't it come together cost-wise and technology-wise? And there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in the panoramic software world. So there was definitely hope. So now, there we go. So, <clears throat> in 2013, I became aware of three, a combination of three things. <clears throat> Darn good little cameras in the form of the HD GoPros. That blue hoo-ha thingamajig sitting on top of the tripod, 3D printed by a company called 360 Heroes, that holds um, all your GoPros so they cover the sphere. Um, and some really hot software from a company called uh, Color um, called Autopano. There's other software out there as well, but that was the one that we became aware of. And that was very exciting to me because um, we could do it for about 5,000 bucks. Um, red ones are really expensive. Just the glass is really expensive. A technician who knows it operated. All of these limitations seemed like, oh, wow, okay, maybe we could actually do this. And so we got into it. And what we found was that it is technically challenging because there's a lot of fiddling. You got 10 cameras, you got all this stuff. Um, and if you've got, if you need someone else to do it the way we did when we were at Goddard in the clean room and we had NASA people setting up our equipment, it becomes really tricky. 
So not only is setting up the equipment challenging, but setting up your shots is challenging. Because remember, it's a full sphere. And so you got to figure out what's in your shot, what's not in your shot, what are you going to use. Any track that's too long will appear in your shot. Um, how are you going to move the camera? Um, and we used cranes, we used electric wheelchairs, we used carts, we used all kinds of crazy stuff to get our shots. And you can see in the middle, a still shot creates its own special challenges. Um, there we are with a cart on the right with no track um, because we wanted this long, long shot. And then, of course, why not use a pickup, right? Um, but the challenge was moving that camera smoothly enough that you won't make your audience sick. They're smoothing software, but you got to have pretty good material to start with. Um, so if you manage to get through all of that, you end up with a series of bizarre looking frames, 4,000 pixels tall, 8,000 pixels across. And what you're actually looking at at there is the combination of 10 video streams put together. So each of the different colors is showing you a different camera there. How the heck do you get to it? Well, the software has got to do four different things. It's got to synchronize the different video streams in time. It's got to warp them so that they're curved and funny looking and can be stitched together. It's got to do the color grading because each of those GoPros is doing its own thing with its own little teeny brain in terms of exposure and white balance and all that stuff. And then it's got to do the exposure matching so that you end up with a nice looking frame. So on the left, you've got the equirectangular frame that represents the complete sphere. On the right, you've got a hemisphere. Why the heck put up with that ridiculous amount of data on the left why make your computers groan and miserable? Why make your life miserable? And the answer is that you don't necessarily know exactly what you're going to want up in your shot. So there we are looking straight up. There we are looking mostly up. And there we are looking horizontally. And I can pick the angle after we've done the shooting. In addition, there's the question of how much do you see. If you hold your hand right in front of you, directly under your eyes, and you see only from the horizon up, the world actually looks kind of strange. If, on the other hand, you allow yourself to see a little bit of foreground, the world starts looking considerably more normal to an audience. So by mapping more than 180 degrees of view onto the 180 degrees of the dome, um, you're really able to do some wonderful, magical stuff. And so now I want to show you two clips. I want to show you a demonstration of the field of view effect, and then I want to show you some of the clips of Goddard just so that you can see what it all looks like um, uh, uh, when, it's, when it's put together. Hey, Dana, is there a way that we actually can mute that projector? Because that black is nasty. Um, or I can, just hold some, I can just hold a notebook up in front of it if that makes our lives easier. All right, Dana, can you, can you show both clips in sequence? And I'll, I'll just talk over them. So this is only 35 seconds, so look sharp. And also look all the way around the dome. The, hor the horizontal horizon in this dome is really helpful to demonstrate the power of this effect. We found that 220 was about right for these terrestrial shots. In space, it doesn't matter so much. But on the ground, it, it, it's tremendously, tremendously important. This is actually inside the clean room where the James Webb Space Telescope is being constructed right now. And now for thrills and chills, Dana, if you'll run. Yeah, really. Say that again? Play it again, Sam. Well, get ready for this. <laughs> Don't get this. 
sold for the difference between them being out. Some of the scenes that you see will be, will be eliminated. We're on a man lift here, slowly coming down. That's a... This is one of the mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope. They would not allow us to pass directly over here. I think you can understand why. We're, we're hanging from a 35-ton gantry crane that in order to smooth things out, we had to, we had to pick up an additional 2,500 pounds of weight. Because that crane, which you now see above us, is, is not smooth enough to carry a two-pound camera rigged smoothly. So, Dave, if I can have the last slide back. I just want to give you, um, I want to show you on the last slide, uh, the address of, the, there's a great blog. If you search for 360 video primer on the fulldomeblog.com, which is run by the guy on the left, you can get the technical details of this. Come to my poster session, come to the exhibit halls, chat with me. Um, if I've got time, I'll take questions. Yes, you've got two minutes. Ah! Fantastic. I would be happy to take any questions and I'd be happy to chat with any of you later on in the conference. The point is that you can do this and we together need to figure out what the heck do we do with this technology, particularly in live program. And we so do have questions. a mic runner, so please wait for the mic. Yes. Oh, we have a question over here. Am I running No, she's got it. I was wondering if you see this as a, as a solution. One of the problems that happens in full dome is that you've got domes like this, which are flat, and then you've got domes that are you know 45 degrees tilted. And if you show content designed for this on this, you can kind of feel like you're hanging forwards in space in a real way that's yeah. uncomfortable to the audience. So do you see film more than what you need and then render it for the tilt of the dome? Yeah, not only do we film more than we need, when we create a show, we also render out more than than we our models of course are so we have to do the same thing in both worlds but yes it's very very handy to have this particularly because we're still amateurs in terms of cinematography with this and so the ability to say oh it's not quite right and oh my god we just blew that shot we got to go back to goddard no i got a whole sphere i can i can do so much artistically with that with that sphere so it does solve some problems yeah David, it's really wonderful. Um, I know you've got a nice budget on that, but do they make like Steadicam platforms for these uh, rigs? And could you, I know you can't, they probably do. Do those exist and can they even be leased? Um, not that, not that I know of. I think you'd have to. I think you'd have to improvise. We actually found the motorized wheelchair with someone sitting in with a tripod kind of attached to it above their heads, amazingly effective. And the bizarre thing was, in our museum when we were testing this out, nobody noticed. <laughs> I mean, here you were driving around with the Death Star with blinking red lights above your head, and people ignored us. Um, uh, so I don't have a steady cam solution, but I, I think that you know stuff like that will 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 come along. Um, the gantry crane is a nice solution, but of course it's upside down. It's a Oh, that's, that's all we've got. So if you've got more questions, come seek me out. Okay. Our next paper uh, is from uh, Michael Doubt. Uh, the paper's title is From Concept to Screen, Deconstruction of a Full Dome Promo. Thanks very much. So I've got about a 30 minute presentation to do in the next 10 minutes. So what we're going to do is talk about uh, the creation of our Digistar 5, what we call our sizzle reel that we showed last night. How many of you got to see that last night? Good. So this will make sense. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the creative process we went through because it was a very strategic uh, decision to create and craft the demo the way that we did. And uh, there were some interesting obstacles to making it all happen. So we started with the concept and in that concept development phase we had uh, several things that we wanted to consider. We wanted to consider uh, what our goals were and we 
brainstormed the concept to make sure that we left no stone unturned so we could try to come up with something out of the box a little bit. And we broke the concept into scenes and we identified it, the, the tools and the resources that we needed to make this all happen because um, anytime you're facing a production, you've got resource and time and, and budget issues. And so we set the budget and then we uh, wrote scripts or, or a script and then it turned into many scripts in the process. But here's the initial goals we set out to accomplish. Here's the, come on, technology. It's great when it works. Ready to go. It is connected. It was connected. Yeah, that's great. Hey, look at that. Okay, create a demo that's more impressive and impactful than last year's successful demo. And, and so when we did the 2012 rollout of Digistar 5, uh, people reacted very positively to our demo and uh, we were facing a sequel problem. And we wanted to make sure that we had something that was going to be at least as good. And the problem with doing something well is you have to figure out how to do it better and that's not very easy. Uh, and we wanted to highlight the specific features uh, that included our new features as well as our old features and that could have been a half hour demo and we didn't want to do that so we had to be careful. And then we wanted to integrate customer testimonials in to the end of the demo and that required a little bit more effort. Next slide please, I don't know why this isn't working. We can all read that. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Dana, can you just advance to the next slide, please? Sorry. Oh, it's on the iPad. Jim, you're awesome. We've got every possible device back there. There we go. Oh, yeah. That was a little quick, but I might. Can you go back, please? Or do we know how to do that? Probably not. Oh, heavens. All right. Where's the slide tray? Where's the slide tray? Exactly. All right, we're going to try this again. Oh, this is just lovely. I'm going to go to the back and do it off my iPad. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. Sorry about that. It's a race over. Yeah, I'll get it. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's just kill it entirely. Sorry, guys. It was going to be really good, too. There we go. That's what I want to get rid of. All right, once more with feeling. I know you're going to get a ton out of this in the last 30 seconds that I have. Come by the booth and I'll give you the detailed presentation. Anyway, so we had things that we wanted to set out to do. We wanted to make sure that, uh, ah, we wanted to make sure that we could play the darn presentation. Okay. There we go. Hey, look at that, it actually works. Okay, so we wanted to create a demo that was more impressive and impactful than last year's demo. We wanted to highlight this, that we already talked about all that, and that's where we got stuck, and we're stuck again, isn't that great? Come on. <laughs> Ah, there we go. And now we're just going everywhere. Going back. All right. Okay, so I said, let's think outside the box on this one and do something really new. Well, new scares people. And so uh, my scary big ideas were to tell a narrative story with multiple actors to do full dome live action location shooting like uh, David uh, just described in employ a sense of humor and produce at 8K 60 frames per second. So we did some live action camera testing and the cameras weren't quite up to snuff last year when we were putting uh, the, the demo together. So we ended up having to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite the script to fine tune it, to adjust the scope of the project and listen to feedback. And this is a, an important part of it because nobody wants to hear negative feedback, but sometimes you have to do that. So uh, we, uh, we needed to change the concept but preserve as many of the big scary ideas as we could. So we planned the shot list, we, we thought of our beginning and the ending, we wanted to tell the Digistar 5 cloud story because that was really important uh, for us as a new feature this year. We wanted to highlight the features and customer testimonials and so we had to ask ourselves what live action shots did we need with our actor and how in the world were we going to get customer testimonials on a cloud system that didn't exist yet. So we had to uh, first create 8K 60 frame per second source material, we had some in our archive of uh, material that we repurposed and I guess Mike 
presentation doesn't want to play anymore. This presentation is sponsored by Apple. Um, <laughs> all right, so where were we? I was rambling somewhere. Okay. And so we also captured a lot of material from Digistar, which made it very convenient and gave us uh, ultimate flexibility on that. Once we had all the scenes underway, I went through a, a long process of trying to transition everything together. And it was really important that one scene seamlessly matched into the next one where it felt like it belonged. One of my favorite transitions in the piece was uh, going from this uh, dense galaxy database where we fired an 8-bit uh, cannon up into the sky and it blasted and then we went into a Space Invader scene. So just little things like that which made the whole piece feel more organic. And here's uh, just an excerpt from our green screen shoot. We shot with a red camera so we could get really good resolution on the actor. And this is a particular sequence where she's trying to say all the different languages in the native languages and she got pretty excited about this. Can we have audio up please? We can try. Because the gag's at the end. Nothing else has worked, so why should this work? <laughs> Wait for it. Oh, okay, we don't have it. Anyway, so she says all the languages, and then she screams in the light and just about blows out the, uh, right there, <laughs> blows out the sound person's ears and really, really enjoyed that. And then she has to apologize to everybody. So the adventure of that. And this is just uh, an example of uh, how we had to direct her to lift up the dome and keep her clear of the frame because obviously if her head cut into the frame like that she would be partially headless and it wasn't a horror film so we didn't want to do that. And uh, what ended up happening in the show is the shot that we took, her hand went up a little bit too high. It wasn't this shot but it was another one where she lifts up, lifts up the dome initially so we had to put her fingers back on. One of our CG guys did that for us so that was nice. So putting it all together, the transitions like we, like we talked about, that was uh, just making sure it all fit like a glove, like it was supposed to be. So the false start worked as we hoped. In other words, we started it just like our previous year's demo, and then we had her lift up the dome and go into the cloud speech and tell us all about those new features. She did a wonderful job and uh, really connected with the audience, and she was also uh, being able to indicate things that she was doing to uh, avoid us having to say a lot. It had strong audience impact, and it was a powerful visual story of D5. And then we got our custom customer testimonies. We had like nine beta testers who were running the software, and they shot video of themselves on webcams or um, iPhones or whatever, and they sent those to us, and we put that together to end up the production, which ended up very nice. So we preserved uh, some of the, the big ideas. We didn't have a narrative story with multiple actors. We had a single actor. We didn't do uh, full dome live action because the camera didn't work and the tech was killing our presentation today too. Why not? Um, we employed a sense of humor, especially now. Uh, to some degree, we got that in the, in the show and we definitely produced it 8K 60 frames per second. So thanks very much. <laughs> Any questions? Do we have time for questions? Do you have time for me to run out of town? Yeah, we have a question back here. Yes. How long did the whole process take? Uh, the production cycle is about six months. Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs> There's actually time for questions. Well, to me. We're a little behind schedule, so that helps. Yep, that works. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. <laughs> All right. For our uh, final paper for this session, uh, we have uh, Jim Schweitzer with uh, "Exploring Mars" from an or from an Urban Arts and Media College. Uh, give me one second to just double check the.
I've got an image. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Schweitzer. I'm gonna. I don't want to trip over any wire. I may come around here if I, this thing works. Um, I, I know a lot of you, and I've worked on. I think about planetariums that span six orders of magnitude uh, in cost. So I'm going to talk to you about a program. I don't really have a planetarium anymore. I worked through planetariums. I also work at Columbia College in Chicago. And I got so excited about this. This actually costs nothing. So this is like the, it, it's a program, it's, but it's really an educational program that I think planetarians are interested in. Um, it's part of, uh, I used to work for NASA, but this is not, I'm not really a show for them, although they're happy to be ta that I'm talking to planetarians, especially the GLPA, about this. How many have heard of the Mars Education Imaging Project? Okay, a few, a few over here. Okay, good. So you guys know what I'm talking about. How many have actually used it? Okay, good. So there's, got a, a compatriot here. It's really cool, isn't it? My students absolutely love anything and everything Mars and curiosity. Right, it's just fabulous. So this is uh, the basis of the program. It costs nothing. If you have a computer lab and you have students and you have time, you can do this program. And I think it could integrate nicely with planetariums. Um, so. And these are the devices we get to use. We have uh, access to billion-dollar spacecraft, in particular the Mars Odyssey, using the Themis camera on the Mars Odyssey. We also have access to the MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, with its high-rise camera, which has uh, resolution uh, much better than most of the full-dome things here by far. We have resolution on Mars down to 30 centimeters. So this is really, really, really nice stuff to work with. And uh, the, the, what we've done is I've used it in classes on astrobiology, but also with high school students. And I'll show you the high school students later talking about it. And the whole basis of this is to use layer-based uh, image mapping of Mars. It's, we use JMARS as the, the analysis tool. It's very much like GIS. How many have ever used GIS? Okay, ISRI, the company that puts out the GRS thing, they've just given software to every single middle school in the United States. This is a big deal. Okay, so this actually amplifies it. I'm going to just going to show you one of the, this is a Mars image. You've got the, the Tharsis region over here, Elysium here. This is the, almost the whole planet here. You can see the scale down here. We, in the springtime in astrobiology, again, my students are like arts majors. They're um, fashion design. I've got uh, journalism students. I've got musical theater students. who are actually really good at presenting. Uh, so we compared a couple of volcanic regions, uh, looking for lava, t looking at lava tubes. These are the stamps. These are the uh, Themis images that went into this one group. You can see the, the lava, lava collapsed lava tubes here. And I want to just show you one of the results. Of this this is a typical Themis image. It's about 18 kilometers across. Okay. And looking and studying this lava tube, we saw this little glitch here in the corner of the Themis. And so we then turned to, to high rise which gives much higher resolution, and we discovered a cave. It's called a skylight. There are very few known on Mars. So this was done by art students, it was, and they, they love this stuff. They love the astrobiology connection. I'll just zoom in on it. So this is our cave on Mars. Uh, this is 100 meters. So this thing is about 130 meters across, and about I, you can get the, they can figure out the depth by using the shadow length and the sun angle. So this is, it was really exciting, and exciting for the students. Uh, I give an analogy, I've done this for the PR people at school, so if you were to just go looking for that uh, cave uh, on your own on Mars, you can figure out what the area of the Martian surface divided by the area of the cave. You don't want to hazard a guess as to what that is? I use this to impress the PR people at the school. It's 14 billion to one. So these things are really, really, really tiny. We have Mars map better than we have the Earth map. Uh, and it's, it's really a wonderful thing. It's not, it's not a complete map. Uh, during the summer, you'll see a little video of some students I had who we studied dust devils on Mars. The nice thing about it, it's a real inquiry project. It's a real research project. They have to come up with the topic. They have to uh, come up with the questions. We have to have it reviewed by Arizona State University's Planetary Science Lab. Then they give us act. Well, we get access anyways. Everybody has access to these data, but they coach us through it. Then in the end, uh, they come on and review the final report and so on. So we've looked at dust devils on Mars this summer. I'll show you some students who did that. But currently, I have two groups working on this. 
uh, group of Chicago high school students who are looking at these seasonal black spots at high, lati high southern latitudes. These are due to geysers, uh, CO2. And they have an undergraduate astrobiology class looking at dune fields in craters with gullies. So these data are all there. I mean, you have to coach them through it. It's, it's, but it's real research. And so, uh, and they produce real good undergraduate level research. Uh, this uh, term, in fact, they have to uh, get their proposals in. We will have the ability to target Themis camera to look at specific regions we have. So the program actually allows them to send commands to spacecraft on Mars. So, uh, and I can't say, I don't get any credit for this. It's really the folks here, including the others at Arizona State University and JPL, which has given them the contract. Also, uh, Phil Christensen is the godfather of the Themis thing. He was been our reviewer. It's just great to have the principal investigator of you know, top planetary, uh, Mars planetary scientists in the country actually do the reviewing. So it's good. We had one student, again, this is Columbia College, it's not a research university, a journalism student that hired for an internship at NASA Houston. She's there now working on the Orion Project. And when she applied and told them she could use JMARS, which is our analysis tool, they hired her on the spot. So I can't underscore enough the ability to help these students learn these sorts of things. I'm not going to talk anymore. How much time do I have? OK, that's perfect. We put together a little video. I, did, I actually got out of the room. This is not scripted. Uh, we, we interviewed the students as we went through the process this last summer to have them describe what they were doing. So these students you'll see, they're from all over the city of Chicago. They're self-selected. They basically, they got started when we were at the IPS meeting in Beijing. I uh, had somebody start them on some of the background, but then I was with them all through every afternoon in July. And <coughs> all this let them talk about the project. Watch the audio. The Junior Research Scientist program is a program that allows teenagers like me um, to be in an environment where we can do research with college professors um, and learn about astronomy as well as like physics. The goal of the astronomy section, we're mainly focusing on researching on, um, research on Mars. We're using JMARS, which is a really handy um, computer program um, where we can access Themis images or images that NASA astronomers have put up um, through their um, technology and like telescopes. It takes all the stamps that the satellites have taken of Mars and it basically just puts it in one program so it's easier to navigate. You could set the seasons by you, you, uh, setting the solar longitude and it's pretty easy and this is really a lot of fun. One of the really cool things about this program is that you're able to see the surface of Mars in extremely high resolution so that it's, it doesn't look like this big foreign planet that's millions of light years away. It kind of looks at something that you can access at your fingertips. So you can see a whole bunch of geological formations. And while you're looking at these images, you can pretty much relate them to things that you've seen on Earth. I think it's a really powerful tool. It's, it's great for finding very specific things very quickly that would be almost impossible to find just looking at a database of just images or a list of links and looking at each one and seeing if it's good. Going into it, I was kind of unsure as to what we would be really doing. They were telling us that it would be like, oh, it's all your research, but I kind of thought that it would be more of like a classroom setting where they would be telling us, oh, look through these textbooks or these databases and tell us what you think about what is going on on Mars. I really didn't think that it would be so um, based on our own ideas. Well, like when I first thought, like, before I started doing this, I thought that research was just like reading a whole bunch of articles online or in the library and then like referencing them. Um, research, it's not as simple as they make it in school. Um, it's actually, I think research in a more professional way, like I've learned here, is more fun than in school because there's because we started with a with a question, two separate questions in the teams, and then we realized that like some certain questions would probably not be able to be answered. Then we had to make other questions that could be relevant to um, the research that we're able to do, which is why we were able to um, go more on 
a Aeolian features such as like Dust Devil tracks and things like that. And that's why our um, ending question were basically how does crater craters affect the way Dust Devils roam? It, it was a lot of teamwork and a lot of data came in in a very short period of time because we had uh, 30 kids working on it, 30 people looking at these things and gathering the data. It's really in-depth. You have to go really in-depth about in little things that you didn't think would matter. They're like, they end up making a big difference in your results and sometimes it's that that has the impact on your whole topic that you're researching so you have to be really detailed about it. It, it was really awesome. I mean, our instructors well, you uh, have really, you know, taught us a lot in this, you know, limited amount of time that we've had. I mean, it's it's stuff that I hadn't even bothered, you know, learn trying to learn before because I thought it was way over my head. Um, I really think that through this program, I actually got to do like more concrete research, and a lot of other like science um, summer programs were just like after school programs. They it's more like a, a teacher who's up there like lecturing and like you're learning through like textbook resources but like this I feel like I'm actually um, being like a junior research scientist as the program's name um, says and I feel like I actually get to like think out of the box and like develop my own questions and also I feel like um, whatever I feel like, like my hypotheses I feel like or like my thoughts about the creators or whatever I feel like I can actually like discuss with my peers and like talk to Jim about them and like he'll give me like good feedback about it so like I'm really happy that I did this program because it's really like a it's really a better um, understanding about like what scientists do. But I thought it was really a really great experience. My name is Andrea Martinez I'm 14 years old. My name is Bukuru Anaklet and I'm 16 year, years old. And Here are you I'm, I'm 17. I'm Matt uh, I'm 17. Well, my name is Lorena Juarez. I'm currently 16 years old. Miss Jessica Machu. I am 15. My name is Nova Shu, and I'm currently 16 years old. My name is Malik Griffin. I am 16. My name is Ayana Guapa. I'm 15. My name is Annie. I'm 17. My name is Isaac Glass, and I am 15 years old. Okay. <laughs> I wanted them to show that. This is the URL for this, okay? So if you're interested in this program, the whole curriculum is there, the whole guide. If you want questions, I can answer questions and take suggestions. Well, I can't um, take suggestions, but no, I can the, help you out. Sorry, we ran, we ran out of time for the, for the, uh, for the questions. Um, get a hold of uh, Jim throughout the conference if you have further questions, please. Um, and that wraps up the first photo session.